In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Taking the preacher's prerogative, there we go, everybody. <laughs> there we go. Nice. I'll have to take a picture of you later. That was me getting a Pokemon. All right. <laughs> As you might expect, there were uh, a few days where I knew about this position before I could tell all of you. Tim knew as well, I let him know. The last time I preached, I knew and you didn't, which is a weird thing to have happen. The gospel that Sunday was Jesus calling people to follow him. And in that calling to follow him, the last person, if you might recall, said, okay, Jesus, I'll go with you. Just let me say goodbye to my loved ones first. And Jesus said, no. No one who sets hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. So I was joking with Tim, I should have just read the gospel and walked straight out the door. <laughs> and then we looked ahead. What is the gospel for your last Sunday? And imagine instead of Martha, it says, Tim, and Tim looks to the Lord and says, Lord, do you not care that my brother has left me to do all the work by myself? <laughs> Sandy has chosen Hawaii. No. <laughs> Mary and Martha are huge. We hear about them even if you're not in the church. And you have to choose in some way which one you want to be. It's like one of those online uh, personality profiles. What is you? Am I a Martha? Am I a Mary? It's like a philosophy professor I once knew who in his first class would get up and say one thing to them. He would stand up and say, there are two kinds of people in this world. The kind who think there are two kinds of people in the world and the other people. <laughs> and he would walk out. Some would say that it's as simplistic as that. Am I a Mary or a Martha? Because even people who aren't versed in the Bible or even in Christianity know Martha and Mary. And it's not that there weren't real people named Martha and Mary, but there are times when we are doing the better thing and times when we're not. Now, this story isn't telling us to be lazy or that being a good host or seeing what needs to be done and doing it are the wrong path. We don't know the full context of the relationship between Martha and Mary. Perhaps day after day, Martha works at two jobs, only coming home to find that Mary was just sitting all around all day, getting Pokemon while the garbage is piled up and a stink emanates from the sink and refrigerator. Maybe they'd finally reached an agreement about sharing chores after years of arguments and nasty fighting. And now when the most important guest they've ever had under the roof shows up, Mary wigs out and doesn't lift a finger to help. Maybe it's the last straw for Martha. Now we, I think, tend to identify with Martha. And if you do, you see a situation that is very unfair. Just like the parable of the elder brother and the prodigal one isn't fair. Just like the parable about the workers who toiled all day through the heat, getting the same pay as the ones who came at the end, isn't fair. But here's the thing. These parables aren't about parity between brothers or co-workers. Not even close. And this story is not about the relationship between Mary and Martha. It's about the relationship we have with Jesus. What sort of relationship would you have with Jesus? What sort of relationship would you have, would Jesus have with you? We have Mary here sitting at Jesus' feet. This is the pose of a disciple. To sit at someone's feet says, listen, I want to listen to you, I want to learn from you. It's why so many people got shocked and dismayed by that demoniac that Jesus healed. You know, the one that said, we are legion, and all of them went into the pigs and they all flew them, uh, threw themselves off the cliff. Because when they saw this guy who'd been crazy for so long, the people who lived around him, and he had been spending all of his time in a cemetery. And when they see him healed and in his right mind, he is sitting at Jesus' feet like a disciple, a follower, a learner. 
that being present with Jesus is so important. Many of you know that I particularly enjoy C.S. Lewis and his screw tape letters are one of those legendary ones. Read it if you haven't read it yet. They're a wonderful thing. Um, it's a little spooky. I used to listen to it car, uh, you know, in the tape in the car and it's having this demonic voice in your head as you drive along the road it can be a little off-putting. But the screw tape letters is one senior demon giving ideas for how to mess with his client, the human, uh, to his younger cousin or nephew, I think it is. And he's giving him all kinds of advice on how to drag down his client. So here is from the screw tape letters. The humans live in time, but our enemy, so you should read God here, our enemy destines them to eternity. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity, to its, to, to eternity itself, and to that point of time which they call the present. For the present is the point at which time touches eternity. Of the present moment, and of it only, humans have an experience analogous to the experience which our enemy has of reality as a whole. In it alone, freedom and actuality are offered them. He would therefore have them continually concerned with either eternity, which means being concerned with him, or with the present, either meditating on their eternal union with or separation from himself, or else obeying the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present pleasure. Lewis, well, the, the demon goes on to say, our business is to get them away from the eternal and from the present. With this in view, we sometimes tempt a human, say a widow or a scholar, to live in the past. But this is of limited value, for they have some real knowledge of the past, and it has a determinate nature, and to that extent resembles eternity. It is far better to make them live in the future. Biological necessity makes all their passions point in that direction already, so that thought about the future inflames hope and fear. Also, it is unknown to them, so that in making them think about it, we make them think of unrealities. In a word, the future is, of all things, the thing least like eternity. It is the most completely temporal part of time, for the past is frozen and no longer flows, and the present is all lit up with eternal rays. Hence, all, nearly all vices are rooted in the future. Gratitude looks to the past and love to the present. Fear, avarice, lust, and ambition look ahead. Or if you prefer it, here's how Lao Tzu puts it. If you are depressed, you are living in the past. If you are anxious, you are living in the future. If you are at peace, peace you are living in the present. How are we going to really be in the present and in the presence of Christ? Here we have Mary in our gospel this morning acting as a disciple with Jesus rather than a task-oriented Christianity. That's a really dangerous thing, this task-oriented Christianity. Stuff to do. Church wants us to do stuff. God wants us to do stuff. Let's do stuff. We have a wonderful group of work campers who just got back yesterday. God bless you for being awake. They just got back and they were busy for a whole week doing stuff. But as much fun as the doing stuff was and as many stories as they will have, I guarantee you the stories that will last, the things that have touched them, are the being present with other people. The people in their youth group, the people on their work crew from other churches, the worship time together, and the residents in the houses they were fixing up. That being present with is really the key. Now, priests, above all, can be really bad at this task-oriented Christianity. We've got to-do lists just like the rest of you, but they're sort of connected with the church. So they can feel kind of holy, but they're just a bunch of things. I might have this huge to-do list, and one of you all might come in and, oh, man, you know, I was getting work done. This church thing would be really easy if it weren't for all these people. It was, uh, <laughs> Tim is fond of saying, and he puts it so well, that uh, the people are not the distraction. 
the people is what it's all about. It's as if Jesus is saying to us, I'm not as concerned about getting things done for the church as I am with how you are with me. Because in the end, that is the work of the church, to sit at the feet of Jesus as disciples, to be loved by God and to know it, to accept it. We don't act in the world so that we can be loved by God. We acknowledge that we are loved by God, the miracle and the all and the inconceivable truth of the fullness of that love, which we haven't and we could never earn. And we are inspired and empowered to act in the world because of it. Here again from C.S. Lewis. He therefore, I believe, wants them to attend chiefly to two things, to eternity itself and to that point of time which they call the present. He would have them continually concerned either with eternity, which means being concerned with him, or the present, either meditating on their eternal union with or separation from himself, or else obeying the present voice of conscience, bearing the present cross, receiving the present grace, giving thanks for the present pleasure. Ultimately, the gospel story this morning is not about the relationship between Mary and Martha. It's about the relationship they have with Jesus. Does Jesus want a minion or a disciple? It's not about the work, it's about the presence. The story of Mary and Martha is ultimately remembered in the Bible because it is relevant to all readers and hearers and seekers through all generations, to you and to me. What sort of relationship would you have with Jesus? What sort of relationship would Jesus have with you? The story of Mary and Martha is about us living fully into this very moment of closeness with God, attending to our relationship to God. Choose the better part. It will never be taken away from you.